Today we're going to look at 2.4. It's going to cover some of the things that we did yesterday uh, about solving equations, except now instead of having an equal sign, we're going to have like a greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So you're going to have an inequality symbol. Okay, those are the four inequality symbols. And just a reminder, if you don't know which one's which, okay, in order, less than, less than or equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to. So like yesterday, I think some, some of this will definitely be reviewed. Okay, these are examples of inequalities. Um, the one on the left, 3 is less than 8, and that's just a true statement. The one on the right, it's kind of like when we talked about a conditional equation. That's like a conditional inequality. Uh, it could be true if you pick the correct value. The difference with an inequality is there's usually a bunch of answers that work. It's not like an equation where sometimes you can only find one. In this case, you could plug in any number bigger than 4, and it would be an answer. So there's really an infinite amount of answers. So the way you can tell if a number is a solution uh, is kind of like the way you can tell if it's a solution in an equation. But let's say I gave you the number 5. If I want to know if 5 is a solution to this inequality right there, all I have to do is take and replace the x with a 5, and then see if I get a true statement. So let's try it. If I replace x with 5, I get 3 times 5, which is how much? 15. And is 15 greater than 12? Yes. Yeah. Then 5 is a solution. Is it the only solution? No. But it is a solution. Uh, let's try plugging in 3. If we plug in 3, 3 times 3 gives me 9. And then is 9 bigger than 12? No. So 3 is not a solution. Question on that? All right, so one kind of inequality that we are going to solve is a conjunction. And a conjunction is just two inequalities connected with the word and. Like that. Usually when you have an and, uh, it's almost like you're saying between. So when I say x is bigger than negative 1 and x is less than 3, it's like I'm saying x is between negative 1 and positive 3. When you have an inequality with the word and in the middle, you can take all of this, and you can squish it together. Okay, we can shorten it. And the way you can shorten it is like this. Put the x in the middle. You put the smaller number on the left. You put the bigger number on the right. And both inequality signs would point to the left. What I just wrote up above it is exactly the same thing as what's down below. It's just a shorter way to write it. And I can kind of put boxes around like what's coming from where. This part right there comes from that part right there. In fact, they, they look exactly the same. This part is coming from that part. We have a negative 1. We have an x, and the symbol is pointing towards the negative 1. Like if you made this an arrow, it's like it's pointing at the negative 1. Cool. Look at what's below. We have a negative 1, we have an x, and the symbol is pointing at the negative 1. So what's in those two blue boxes are exactly the same. But that's one way you can combine those together. So let's say you had x is greater than negative 1 and x is less than negative 1. Could you make a conjunction of that? x has to be greater than negative 1 and less than negative 1? Yeah. No, because that's not possible. So you can't, like, if it doesn't work, you just can't make a conjunction out of it? Right. Okay. 
Yeah, it has to be something that like makes sense. And you can't have a number that's bigger than negative one and smaller than negative one. Uh, that's the same thing I wrote up above. Now, some people might combine it a different way. There is another way you can do it by putting the x in the middle, and then what's that? Oh, and then you can switch everything. I, I don't do it this way, but you can put the bigger number on the left. You can put the smaller number on the right and have the inequalities point the other way. This is another way that is correct to combine these two inequalities together. So what that inequality is basically saying is it's a it's it's an interval. It's like a it's like a section of numbers. In this case it's the section of numbers between negative 1 and positive 3. Does it include negative 1 or positive 3? No. It, when we say between, in this case, it's strictly between, not the ends themselves. Now, what if you had something like this? Uh, let's say negative 2 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 5. How could you take that? and split it back up into two separate inequalities. Yeah? X is greater than or equal to negative 2, mm -hmm. and X is less than or equal to 5. Perfect. So sometimes you may have to take something that's combined together and split it apart, or take something that's split apart and combine it together. And the key to, to doing it either way is there's one inequality right there. Uh, I also like how he reversed it and put the x on the other side. It's not wrong to write negative 2 is less than or equal to x. We just usually put the x on the left. That's how you usually do it. And there's your second one. Right. So in this case, that's called an interval. This would be an interval that includes negative 2 and includes positive 5. Okay, because it's got the equal 2s. Specifically, this kind of interval right, right here that I just circled, that's called a closed interval. Closed means you can include what's on each end. I'm going to write that down. This interval right here is called an open interval. Open means you cannot include what's on each end. <coughs> okay, so we're going to talk about a, a few words that describe intervals. Okay, we're going to talk about open versus closed in a minute. And we're also going to talk about bounded versus unbounded. An interval is bounded if it stops somewhere. Okay? If you have an interval, like you on a number line, and you would shade and draw an arrow, and the arrow points and it means it keeps going, that's not bounded if something just keeps going. Bounded means it starts at a number, it stops at a number, right? Between two and 10, that's bounded. Between negative eight and positive three, bounded. Bounded intervals start and stop at numbers. What else do we sometimes see in an interval that's not a number? What symbol do we use sometimes, yeah? Infinity. infinity. Once you throw an infinity in there, now we're talking about an unbounded interval. It means it goes on forever. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about an unbounded interval in a minute. Uh, but for now, let's just talk about bounded. There's four types of intervals that are bounded. Brackets, I think we've talked about it, but remember bracket means you can include the value. Parenthesis means you cannot include it. So if you want to write an interval where you can include the endpoints, both of them, you put a bracket on each end. This means everything between A and B, including the A and including the B. And if A was 2 and B was 6, it doesn't just mean 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It means everything between 2 and 6. 2.4, 3.41519. It means every single possible number between 2 and 6. 
Now compare it to an open interval. Open interval between two and six would mean everything between two and six, but not the two and not the six. So if it's between two and six, like the highest you could go is like 5.9 repeating. And the lowest you could go is 2 point like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, you can't include the 2 or the 6. So that's an example of a fully closed and then a fully open interval. Could you include 5.9 repeating? Because isn't that just 6? Well, you can include any number as close to 6 as you want, but not 6 itself. I'll say it now. So 5.9 repeating is... I guess it would have to stop somewhere because I mean realistically we can't even if we write 5.9 repeating with like a symbol we actually can't write that by hand writing it out we would have to stop somewhere because we would run out of time writing the point nines so yeah think of it that way okay. you can pick a number as close as you want to six but not six itself. you mean like how they prove like 0.999 is actually one is that what you're talking about it a number that's point nine repeating is equal to the number added. Yeah, point nine yeah. repeating is three thirds. So yeah, it's, yeah, it gets a little tricky because you know if you think about it realistically, you can't write point nine repeating without using a fancy symbol. The only way you can write point nine repeating is to keep writing point nine for the rest of your life. So yeah, uh, we can also have a half open interval, which means you can include one side but not the other. This would be what I would call half open on the right. That's half open on the left. But those are the four types of bounded intervals. Fully open, fully closed, half open on the left, half open on the right. Which one's which? What's that? Did you say which one's which? For right and left? Uh, so parenthesis means it's an open interval. So this one is a half open on the right, and this one is half open on the left. I guess you could also say it in terms of being half closed. Um, our book usually refers to it as half open. Okay, so bounded. Um, what symbol did I say you'll see when it's unbounded? What is it? Infinity, yeah. When it's unbounded, you're going to see an infinity symbol. Those are all unbounded intervals. And I can draw like a picture of some of them if you want to do it on a number line. Okay, here's 0, 5. This would be a closed circle on 5. Shaded to the right has an arrow. It's unbounded. It never stops. Okay, this one would be similar. Except instead of being a closed circle, what kind of circle would we put on five? <clears throat> yeah, this would be an open circle on five. Shaded, right? So then you could also have an arrow pointing left with a closed circle, left with an open circle. Uh, I guess there's one more unbounded interval you can have. Unbounded on it on each end. So here, if you were going to do that as a number line, it's like you're really shading the entire number line. It's just an arrow going both ways. Okay, so unbounded intervals will have infinity in them. So what we want to make sure we can do is change between all these different ways of writing. Okay, what I just circled put a box around, that's three different ways of saying the same thing. X is greater than or equal to 5. That's an inequality. X, uh, or putting a closed circle on 5, shading right, that's a graph. Putting a bracket on 5, comma, infinity with a parenthesis, that's called an interval. So interval, graph, inequality. And we should be able to kind of change between all three. If you're wondering, I just probably talked about this, but why do you put an interval, or why do you put a parenthesis on infinity? Yeah? You can't actually reach it. You, you can't reach it. Okay. So infinity, never put a bracket on it because you can't reach that value. It's, it's more of a concept. It's not an actual number. 
Um, and then they draw pictures of all of these on page 100. Okay, I do pictures of a couple. So let's try this. First of all, what kind of interval is this? Is this bounded or unbounded? Bounded. Bound, what, bounded or unbounded? What do you think? Bounded. This is bounded because it has a starting and a stopping point. There's no infinity in it. So I want to write this as an inequality. Preferably, if we can, with an x in the middle. So anyone think they could tell me like what would go on the left, what would go on the right, and then the two symbols I would use? Yep. Uh, negative 3 is less than. Yep. And uh, greater than or equal to 5. Okay, I do want to put the 5 there. And can you say that symbol again? Greater than or equal to. Less than or equal to. Less than or equal to. All right. So this is saying x is less than or equal to 5 and bigger than negative 3. So that's how you take and change it from an interval to an inequality. Uh, this is a half open interval because it's only one parenthesis and then one bracket. Okay, so it's a half half open, specifically half open on the left. All right, let's try this one. Is this a bounded or unbounded interval? Unbounded. This is unbounded. Now, what is that basically saying? If you just had to describe to somebody as simple as you could, not even an inequality, just ex what that means. Yeah? It's a line that starts at negative 4 and goes right forever. So what kind of numbers does that include? Uh, like if I said pick a number oh, that satisfies you. Everything above negative 4. Or it equals to. So, including, yes. So anything that's negative 4 or higher. So how would you write that as an inequality? Anything from negative 4 and up. Yep. X is greater than, X is greater than or equal to negative 4. Yep. Some people add the part, they say X is greater than or equal to negative 4 and X is less than infinity. Uh, you don't have to tell me X is less than infinity. I know that. Yeah. Everything's less than infinity. So all you really have to do here is say x is greater than or equal to negative 4. An, an unbounded interval is actually shorter to write. You don't need the x in the middle and then the infinity symbol. That's all I'm looking for. Yep? Well, like, I don't think we're going to use this in this class, but like, do the larger infinities mess with this? Like different size infinities? Yeah. Um, no, we don't really talk about different size infinities. But like, would it mess with it? Or is it still the same rules? Uh, no, it'd still be the same rules. That'd be something you might talk a little bit more about in calculus. If you talk about like derivatives and different size infinities, like which one is going to infinity faster, what happens in fractions sometimes. Uh, but not really something we would look at. Yeah. Uh, how about this one? Uh, bounded or unbounded interval? Bounded. That is bounded. So bounded is a little bit more, a little bit more to write. Anyone think they can give me this as an inequality? Yeah. Eight is less than or equal to x. Say it again. Eight is less than or equal to x. What number? Negative eight. Negative eight. Is less than or equal to x. All right. And x is less than or equal to negative three. Yeah. Perfect. In other words, it's every number between negative eight and negative three, including negative eight and negative three. Um, so this is also this is bounded. How else would you describe this interval with the bracket on each end? Closed. closed. This is a closed bounded interval. Okay. Any questions on changing an interval to an inequality? All right. Let's try changing an inequality to a graph. X is greater than or equal to 2. All right, what kind of circle would we need on the 2? Yeah. Closed. Closed. Yep. And then which way should we shade if we want to shade everything greater than or equal to 2? 
Well, we already shaved equal to two, so now I need the greater than part. Right. We got to shave to the right. Yep. Okay. In iEdge Elastic, there'll be a tool you can click. You know, it'll either look like this, it'll look like this, uh, one would look like this, and one would look like this. So I'd give you every possibility. Closed circle, right, left, open circle, right, left. And you'll just click on the tool you need to use. And then I think you can drag the start point to any number. Okay. Any question on that one? All right. Oh, bounded or unbounded? Unbounded. It's got an arrow on it and it just keeps going. That's unbounded. Bounded has to stop. Okay. Let's try this one. Okay, what kind of circle do I need this time? Open, on what number? Good. Uh, which way do I shade? Left. Everything less than the number five. Uh, is this a bounded or an unbounded interval? Unbounded. Goes on forever. Okay, again, hopefully this is mostly, this stuff is review, I think. Um, how about this one? Negative 1 is less than or equal to x, and that's less than 3. So your number line will be set up for you on Edge Elastic. How many circles am I going to need on this number line? Two. Yeah, I'm going to need 2. What kind of circle on negative 1? Closed. Closed. On 3? Open. Open. And where do we shade? In between. OK, bounded or unbounded? That's bounded. It doesn't go on forever. It starts and stops at two numbers. Okay. Any um, questions on that one? Okay. So when we're solving inequalities, we pretty much use exactly the same steps I taught you yesterday with equations. There's only one thing that can trip us up with an inequality, and that's if you multiply or divide by a certain kind of number. Anybody know what kind of number I'm thinking? Zero. Yeah? Zero. Um, so we can never multiply or divide by zero, whether you're solving an equation or an inequality, um, because that would kind of wipe out the whole thing. But there is a number that you could multiply or divide by, and we probably did yesterday. We didn't have to worry about what we're going to have to today. Yeah? If it's negative, then you have to flip the inequality sign. Right. If it's negative, you have to flip the inequality. So if you multiply or divide, not add or subtract, okay, only if you multiply or divide by a negative, you have to flip the inequality. If you don't multiply or divide by a negative, you, you don't have to flip anything. Okay. Other than that rule, everything else, you treat it just like it was an equation. All right. Um, so what do you think? The first thing we would do, uh, it's going to be on the left hand side, that inequality. Yeah, we got to distribute. Okay. Are we multiplying or dividing each side by a negative in that step? No, we're not even doing anything to both sides. We're just distributing. So it's going to be 3x minus 3. Okay. Still, a little bit more we can do uh, on the left side. What else? Yeah. Combine like terms. Yeah, I can combine like terms. Uh, my like terms here are negative 3 and positive 2. And what do you get if you combine those together? Negative 1. Negative 1. So 3x minus 1 is less than 5x plus 6. Combining like terms, you did not multiply or divide both sides by a negative, so you don't flip it. Um, all right. Uh, what should we do next? Yeah. Get 
decks on its own. And one okay, and um, you tell me how you want to do that. Uh, subtract negative six. Subtract six from both sides. Okay. And then subtract three x from both sides. And uh, I think that's it's actually a pretty big way to do it um, because the way Jack just did it, we're not going to have a negative with the x. All right. So three x minus three x is gone. Six minus six is gone. Negative one minus six is negative seven. And we get negative seven is less than or equal to 2x. All right, and my last step. Yep, and is that a negative number we're dividing by? No. You might say, well, there's a negative on this side, but that doesn't matter. You're not dividing by a negative number. So you can leave your answer negative 7 halves is less than or equal to x. Or, how could you write it so that x is on the left? Yep. x is greater than or equal to 7 over 2. No, 7. Negative 7 over 2. Yeah, I, I would prefer the bottom way. Usually I like x on the left and then the number on the right. You wouldn't be wrong if you typed it in like that in Edge Elastic. That would still work. So we didn't have to flip the inequality at all in this problem because we never multiplied or divided by a negative. Had we decided to put the x's on a different side, we might have divided by a negative, or we would have. Any question on that? Okay, so again, probably review from Algebra 1. Okay, and now we're going to look at um, how to do one of these on the calculator. Well, there's, there's two ways you can do it. Okay, I'll, I'll show you both. The first method is to take your problem and rearrange it so that zero is on one side of the inequality. And then what we're going to do is look where the graph crosses the x-axis. To figure that out, we do second calculate root. Okay. Um, we've, I think we've done the root before, right? Second calc root. Yeah. And then your answer is going to depend now. Your answer is either going to be every number that's under the root or every number that's above the root. It depends on where the graph is positive and negative. It depends on what they're asking you for in the question. Once you calculate the root, it's either everything below the root, I guess it could equal the root too, below or equal, or it's everything above or equal. So we're going to try one that's very straightforward. We can do it faster in our head than we can on the calculator. So why would we even bother with the calculator? Well, eventually we're going to have some we might not be able to do in our head. So if, if you solve this one off to the side, you'd have 4x is less than 3. You just add 1 to both sides. And then x is less than 3 fourths. So if you were solving it algebraically, that's the fastest way to do it. You're done. Well, let me show you how you can do it on the calculator. It says to get 0 on one side of the inequality. What's the easiest way? Minus two. Yeah, that's the easiest way to get zero on one side. All right, now we're going to type that in. 4x minus two. And what we're going to look for in the graph is where it is less than zero. What does less than zero mean? It means under the x-axis. So let's type that in. 4x minus 3. Um, I would do zoom 6. I think that'll be perfect. Okay. Let's look at this. Let's put that there. So what are we looking for? 
We're looking for the part of the line that is less than zero. That means below the x-axis. That means I want this. Right up to, but do I include when it hits the x-axis? No. No. So it's almost like there's an open circle there. So it's like I want to know what values of x can I plug in, and I will land on that red part of the line. Would I plug in x values that are bigger than this root, which we already know, but we're going to calculate it. Um, would I plug in values bigger, or would I plug in values smaller? Smaller. Because if you plug in x values that are smaller, you're going to be way down on the red line. If you plug in x values that are bigger, you're going to end up up there. Right? So now we have to find that value on the calculator. So we're going to do second, calc, zero. Pick a point to the left of where it crosses the x-axis. Pick a point to the right. And then the guess doesn't really matter because um, there's only one place where it crosses. So I just hit enter. And it tells us exactly where it crosses. 0.75. Three fourths. And we said that the answer is everything below 0.75. You do it on the calculator, you're usually going to get a decimal. When you do it by hand, you might end up with a fraction sometimes. Okay. But that's, that's one way to do it. Any questions on that? So the second way to do it is don't rearrange anything. Just leave, we're gonna do the same problem again. And just leave it the way they give it to you. Leave the 4x minus one on the left, leave the two on the right, and then plug each one of them in on separate lines in the calculator. Just like this. Put 4x minus one in y1. Put 2 in y2. Now what I'll do is I'll underline it in color so we remember which one is which. 4x minus 1 is blue. And this one was red. That's the color on my calculator. And what I'm looking for now is where the blue one is underneath the red one. Where is the blue less than the red? I'll take graph. Okay, there's the blue. And there's the red. What do you think I'm going to calculate this time? And that's what I need to scroll down so you can see. It's not a root. If I want to know where the blue graph is under the red one, I have to see where these two lines do what? Intersect. So now you calculate an intersect. It's going to give you the same answer that we just did. Just a different way of doing it. And just like when you find the root, your answer is either everything above the point or below the point. In this case, it's an intersect. Is the answer everything above the intersect or everything below? So it's it's the same problem we're doing again. We're just going to do it with uh, method two. Okay, so remember what we want. The blue has to be under the red. That would be, I'll just make it bold, in this section. That's where the blue line is under the red. Find that intersection point. Okay, very similar to finding the root. You do second calc, intersect. Pick a point on the blue, hit enter. Pick a point anywhere you want on the red, it doesn't matter. And does the guess matter? Does the guess matter? 
No, because they only cross one time. They cross more than once. That's when the guess matters. Okay, so they cross when x is 0.75. So, do I want x values that are below 0.75 or above? Yeah, below. If you pick values that are above, the blue line is going to be above the red line. That's, that's not what they wanted. They want the blue line underneath. So it's everything from this point that way. Which method you use, whether you want to do it as an intersection or do it as a zero, I, I don't care. It's, you're going to get the same answer. Question on it. And again, I wouldn't even use a graphing calculator on this one because you can just add one and divide by four a lot faster. But this is when we get ones that we can't do as quickly. We can use the graphing calculator. All right. Um, so a double inequality. Well, you kind of looked at those. A double inequality is just where you have it's a compound inequality. There's Two ways to solve this kind of problem. Well, one way is to split it up. And sometimes you have to. Take this and split it up into that. Negative 8 is less than 2x. And 2x is less than 12. So that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, it's not the way I would do this one, but it, it'll work. You have to take it and split it back up into what it was originally before you, can, before you combine it. You have to do it that way if you have x's in multiple spots, like this. 3x is less than 4x plus 12, which is less than 5 plus x. You have to split that up into two separate problems. That is your first one. That would be your second one. I'm not, I'm not actually going to do this one. But that's how you'd have to split it up. 3x is less than 4x plus 12. Solve it. And 4x plus 12 is less than 5 plus x. But when you only have an x in the middle, there's an easier way to do it. All you have to do in this problem is divide everything by 2, and you can get x by itself. That would not work in this one. You can't just divide everything by 4, and like x is going to magically be by itself. It, it, it won't work. Then you're going to end up with like 3 fourths x and 1 fourth x. you, you got to split that up because there's x's in multiple spots. So in this kind of problem, the goal is to isolate the x in the middle. Again, only if the x is already only in the middle. If you get x's on the left, the middle, and the right, just split it into two problems. You just have to remember, like an equation, if you do something on one side, you have to do it on the other. Well, here it's like you've got three things. You've got the left, the middle, and the right. If you do something in the middle to try to get x by itself, because it's one of the easier problems, okay? it's not, not one, of the, one of the harder problems, it's one of the easier problems, and you can do something to get x by itself in the middle, that's fine. Just do it in the middle, the left, and the right. So in this case, it'd be like negative 4 is less than x which is less than 6, and then you'd be done. All right, I'm going to try one of, the, one of the easier ones with you guys, where there's just a letter in the middle. It's not going to be the type where there's a letter on the left, the middle, and the right. Okay, just, just in the middle. And there's our problem. Negative 3 is less than 2x 
plus 5 divided by 3, which is less than or equal to 5. Okay. Are there letters on the left, the middle, and the right? No. Then we are going to be able to get this x alone in the middle without splitting it into two problems. We can leave it all as one. What do you think the first thing you'd have to do here to start to get what's in the middle, get that x alone? Yeah? Multiply it all by 3. Yep. I'm going to multiply everything times 3, 3, and 3. Did you multiply by a negative? No. Then you don't need to flip anything. If you did multiply by a negative, you would. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. And then in the middle, times 3 divided by 3. We just canceled the 3's out. So what's, um, what's left in the middle? Plus five, yeah, the three completely, this three completely canceled that three. That's gone. Uh, and what about on the right? 15. 15. Yep. Okay, what would be your uh, your next step? Subtract five. Yep, and subtract it from here, there, and there. Uh, what would I have on the left now? Negative 14. Uh, the middle and the right. Ten. And my last step. Divide everything by two. So when there's only a letter in the middle, it's easier. You don't have to split it. That's, that's what this one was. Um, what's negative 14 divided by two? And then that's gone. So now you've got what you wanted in the middle. Just x. And on the right? Question on nine. Okay, so one of the last things we looked at yesterday um, was solving an equation that had an absolute value. And today it's going to be solving an inequality with absolute value. What did we say about the absolute value yesterday? The first thing you have to do is make sure the absolute value is what? By itself. By itself. It's the same thing here. Make sure you get the absolute value by itself first. A lot of times it will be by itself, but if it's not, that's the first step. Once it's by itself, we're going to split it. Okay, split it into two problems. Just like yesterday, the first one is the same as the original problem. You just take out the bars. So if you had something like this, it would be x plus 2 is less than 4. That would be your first one. Now, does anybody remember this in the second equation? What was the extra thing we had to do yesterday? Yep. Make the other side of the inequality negative. Right. We had to change the sign of the number on the other side. But if we make this a negative, there's something else we have to do. we got to flip the sign. And that's the second one. So the second inequality is the same as the original. You take out the bars. You're going to change the sign of the number on the other side. Up to that point, it's the same as what we did yesterday. But now you also have to flip the sign. So the other one you'd be solving here, x plus 2 flip the sign, make the 4 a negative. Now, you're solving both of these, but we have to decide between two words that are going to connect them. What's one word we talked about 
earlier on when you have two inequalities. You can have the word and, and between them. Another word you could put between them is or. We have to decide whether we need an and or we need an or. And that makes a big difference. To decide whether it's an and or an or, basically look at the original problem. So let me go up and look at mine. The original problem here is a less than. If the original problem has a less than or a less than or equal to, you put the word and. So when I solve this problem, it would be an and between them. If the original problem had a greater, right, if you say it like that, you might remember it, a greater or a greater or equal, greater is an or. It's great, but if you say it like greater, greater is an or. So greater, or, less thans, ands. They even kind of sound the same, less than, and. So we'll try, I had two of them, we'll probably just, um, we'll just do one of them. Let's see, um, let's see. do you want to, you want to try an example that has a less than or a greater? Greater. The greater? Yeah. All right, you can do the greater. So this will be example seven, but I'll, I'll change it. Um, does everybody have this before I? All right, so great tour. Okay, first step. Um, make sure the absolute value is isolated. Is it isolated? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. What's going to be the first inequality that I write down when I get rid of the bars? 3x minus 2 is greater than 1. And then 1. And the second inequality? 3x minus 2. And the symbol here is a greater, which means we use the word or. And now we solve each one. So add the two. So I get x is greater than 1 or. And on this one, when I add 2 on both sides, What's uh, negative 1 plus 2? One. 1. And then divide by 3. X is less than 1 third. Now we graph. Uh, we're not doing example 9. Okay, so to graph it, that's just on a number line. Okay, what kind of circle do I need on one? Open and shade which way? Shade to the right. Okay. We're just going to estimate what kind of circle on one third. Open, so again, just, I don't know, maybe right about there. And then shade to the left. And that's how you solve and graph. Okay, so again, I know it's kind of a lot of different things with, with inequalities, but hopefully most of that seems familiar from Algebra 1 or Algebra 2. All right. Um, let me just double check that before you write it down. Uh, 
let's do one more. Okay, so that's the homework. I think it's about the same number of questions as last time. 